Uh, tonight, I would like to uh, review with you uh, some of the common types of things that you hear about. Uh, if you go to the doctor, you have your cholesterol checked, right? That's one of those words. And sometimes your doctor will do tests. Maybe you heard of uh, LDL and an HDL. Mm, there may be some other words you've heard of. Saturated fat, unsaturated fat. I'd like to make those understandable to you and then would like to get a little bit into where heart disease comes from and our understanding of it. Once we understand where it comes from, it's a whole lot easier to understand what to do about it. Heart disease is one of the lifestyle diseases. Yes, there is a little bit of a genetic component, but the truth is, for most people, you don't have to have heart disease. It's something that comes from our lifestyle choices. I like to put it this way. It's something that you earn, not something you catch. <laughs> that is, there's some choices, some things that uh, we can do to make a difference in heart disease. And so, let's talk a little bit, uh, dive right into this whole business of uh, understanding the terminology. Cholesterol, cholesterol. What is cholesterol? Well, up on the uh, screen you see a uh, kind of a, a graphic demonstration of how the biochemists would identify this particular uh, molecule, you can see there are four rings that are purple to make them a little easier to see, and then a tail almost looks like a mouse trying to turn a corner, doesn't it? So that's what it looks like. Um, <clears throat> if you want to understand about uh, cholesterol, uh, let's take you on a, a little <clears throat> story of understanding. Let's say I got some uh, grease on my pants. If I wanted to get the grease out of my pants, uh, what would I do? Well, number one, I would take my pants off, right? I would put them in the washing machine, and I would turn on the water. Now, when I turn on the water, I wouldn't expect the water itself to take the grease out because water and grease don't mix, do they? The only way that we can get water and grease to mix together is to add something, and that is called detergent or soap. Our bodies are water systems. We drink water, we pee water. You know, our, uh, what, 75, 70, 75%, maybe as we get older it's a little less, but about 70% of our body is water. How do you get grease oil, fat to move around in the body. Are you sure you even want grease, oil, and fat in your body? The truth is, fat, oil, is necessary for our, our life. Each cell in the body is separated one from the other by a thin layer of fat. Uh, the little organelles inside the, the uh, cells are in a water system, the walls that delineate things inside cells are made of fat. You might know that fat doesn't carry electricity very well. And if you knew that, you would suspect that maybe the body used fat as uh, electrical insulation right, in the body. And indeed, it does. So fat is necessary for our bodies. When we eat it, it needs to move around in a water system. And the only way it's going to move around in a water system is to have a detergent, a soap. Does that make sense? A major component of the body's uh, detergent or soap is cholesterol. I would like you to think of cholesterol as soap as detergent. Now, <clears throat> we were confused a, a bit by this when we began to discover the wonders of uh, 
cholesterol. It was called the Framingham Study in uh, Massachusetts. We decided to take a group of people and watch them take their uh, tests of their blood, take their body measurements, and watch them over time and see what happened. One of the first things that began to come to the surface is that the higher someone's cholesterol, the higher their risk of a heart attack. So that was a unique understanding for us. Maybe you remember when the news first came out. Well, <clears throat> if cholesterol tends to make your risk of heart attack go up, what do you think we should do to decrease our risk of heart attack? Get the cholesterol down. Well, a little bit of information about cholesterol may be helpful here. Do you know that animals make cholesterol and plants do not make cholesterol? Well, that's one of the ways we can tell them apart. So as we thought about this, we said we want to lower the cholesterol in our blood, so what we need to do is to cut down or eliminate the cholesterol that we're eating. And so some change their diet. And the scientists began to look at this. They were surprised to discover that if they took people off of all the animal products, took them off of all the cholesterol, their <clears throat> cholesterol would only come down 10 or 15 percent. It wasn't coming down that much. Now that's a little frustrating. You and I also, I think, at least I did, I joined the scientists in saying, well, if the cholesterol is too high, what we need to do is decrease the amount of cholesterol that we're eating, that is, stay away from the animal products, and then the cholesterol will come down. It didn't come down that much. There was something we forgot. We're animals. <laughs> <laughs> we make our own. <laughs> Oops. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> here's a trick question for you. You don't mind a trick question occasionally, do you? The teacher tells you right up front it's a trick question. Do coconuts have cholesterol in them? I heard somebody say no definitively. I heard someone with a bit more of a tentative voice say yes. Are coconuts plants or animals? They're plants. Well, as plants, they don't have cholesterol in them. But I've heard on the radio that they do. <laughs> no, they don't. But they do have something in them that stimulates our own body to make cholesterol. Have you heard <clears throat> of uh, fats? Let's see, we've got some, I'm going to introduce you to some of these fats. Here's what, uh, the word we use is lipid, fat, grease, and oil. Uh, triglycerides is the fancy name for, that our body uses for moving, uh, uh, for fat that is moving in the bloodstream, that's called triglycerides. So that's how we measure that. And then saturated fat is the, what the coconut has that tends to stimulate cholesterol production. Fats are fascinating. God has put the body together in an amazing way. Uh, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and, and some nitrogen. Those are the basic building blocks. Now, there's some other little things, but those are the basics. If you take uh, uh, carbons, and they seem to be the building block of everything, each carbon has four hands. And if you put them together in a ring, as in, what, a ring around the rosies, you see six carbons kind of going around in, in a circle, uh, that would be a sugar. Okay? If you put these carbons in a chain, you can see them lined up here, then we call that a fat. See the carbons lined up? Each carbon has four hands. You can see it hanging on to the carbon next to it, and you can see it hanging on to something else. In our little uh, picture here on the bottom of the screen, uh, I didn't write in all the H's. The H's stand for hydrogen. That's one of the smallest of the atoms. There it is hanging on to the carbon, and every carbon has its hand full of hydrogens. And if all the, uh, the hands are full, then we say that that is a saturated fat. That is, every hand is full, therefore all the hands are saturated, or there's not room for any more. That's what it means, saturated fat. That's where the word comes from. Does that make sense to you? 
So that's not too hard to understand. Now, how do you know whether a fat is saturated or not? Can you, do you have to be a biochemist? Or, or is there a, a way for you to tell? Well, fortunately for you, there is a way to tell, and it works like this. Long, straight chains of carbon stacked together very nicely, and at room temperature, they will stand up by themselves. If you take 18 carbons, that's a real common one, saturated fat, and put them all together, they'll stack up, and you can cut it with your knife. We would call that butter, right? You just put it on the table, it sits on a plate, and you can cut it with a knife, and you can spread it on your bread. Does it make sense? Yeah. Have you ever stacked firewood? You know those long, straight pieces? They stack great. You can get a, a, a stack five, six feet up, and it'll hold the snow and the wind for the winter. I, we, do, we don't have any experience with that here in Florida, do we? <laughs> but if you start getting some bent pieces in there, that stack is very likely to fall over. And so it is, if we have some bent fats, they're more likely to fall uh, over. We call those unsaturated fats. Look at the picture here. Do you see the carbons all lined up? I'm sorry, it's down pretty low on the screen. The carbons are all lined up, and at the very bottom there, you can see two carbons that have, excuse the anthropomorphizing, fallen in love. <coughs> And in order to hug each other, they have let go, each let go of a hydrogen. Now they are no longer saturated, they are called unsaturated. And technically, we would say that is monounsaturated. That is, there are two carbons which have fallen in love. It's no longer a long, straight piece, it's now bent. Now, if long, straight pieces stand up like firewood on your table, you can spread them on your bread, butter. What do you call it when you've got a bend? <laughs> your stack of wood's not going to uh, stand up very well. It's more likely to fall over, right? On the table, you recognize this as oil. Oil. When it's bent, it just flows out. You can recognize it. You don't have to be a biochemist. If it stands up by itself, there's a pretty good chance that it's full of saturated fat. If it is oil at room temperature, we can say it is an unsaturated fat. It might be a monounsaturated fat. Take that same 18 carbon uh, fat that we called butter, bend it, Okay, and then we call it olive oil, and we get, it's a monounsaturated. Generally comes about the same length. Does that make sense to you? Now, I guess I didn't tell you this, I, I kind of like to have interaction with the audience, and, and if you have a question, it's okay, raise your hand, and we'll pick it up and take it. Yes, ma'am? Does it include all oils? She says, does it include all oils? Now, that's a... A good question. Fats have uh, 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 different characteristics depending on their length. I can tell you the longer it is, the more likely it is to be solid at room temperature. I can tell you the straighter it is. But if I get a straight fat that is short, it may be an oil. But generally for the oils that we use in cooking and around most of them are the long chain fats, and this holds true. <laughs> that is, if they're long and if they're straight, they're going to stand up. Any other questions? The yes, ma'am. What about the oil and peanut butter? My son had ate a lot of peanut butter. Oh, isn't peanut butter wonderful? Well, anything that has oil in it, even these good oils, still have nine calories per gram, so they can still make you gain weight, and you still need, even though the bent fats don't take as much, they still take some cholesterol to move them around. And the truth is, <clears throat> the, none of the oils are 
perfectly clean just one oil. We tend to say that olive oil is monounsaturated, but it will have some saturated in it. And it so happens that peanuts have quite a bit monounsaturated. You know, you get that, uh, that uh, what do they call it, natural peanut butter, and the oil comes to the surface. Well, that's because it's bent, and it will separate up, and it doesn't want to stay solid. If you get skippies, why, or something like that, where it doesn't separate, they've taken out the oil and replaced it with something that's long and straight, either a trans fat or a saturated fat. So there are tricks, uh, but that's what they have to do to keep us happy. None of us like, I mean, even those of us who won't take anything but natural peanut butter don't like to go in and stir it up when we first bring it home, right? Because uh, that is, uh, it's just a lot of work and the oil tends to spill out the top. So, they're, they're a mixture of oils. Any other questions? I heard one more voice. Uh, I was just going to ask, lard would be another example of the, of the ones that settle like the butter does? Lard would be another example of uh, those that settle. It's a long, straight fat. Uh, <coughs> that's true. Beef tallow would be another one. So, the animal fats in general have more of the saturated fats, and we tend to rank them as saturated fat. It's not that they won't have some unsaturated, because all of seem to be a mix in the natural world, but it's the one that predominates, predominates that we tend to say is the one that defines it. Good. So there's an unsaturated fat, and you've met this monounsaturated fat that has a bend in it. Now, what happens if more than one carbon <coughs> couple fall in love. <laughs> well, it ends up you get more than one bend. <laughs> so there's one bend, there's two, three, four, and no matter how many bends there are after the first one, we call it a polyunsaturated. And it's an oil or it flows at room temperature. So there's no way that your eyes can tell you the difference between a mono and a polyunsaturated. Saturated, all hands are full. Monounsaturated, there's one bend. Polyunsaturated, there's more than one. And there may be many, many uh, bends. So that's the difference between those oils. And the long, straight ones tend to stimulate cholesterol more than uh, the bent ones. You can tell what they're going to look like, what they are, by looking at them on the uh, table. All fats have the same number of calories, whether they're saturated, monounsaturated, poly, trans, or partially hydrogenated. Let's have a quick look at these and, and see what we uh, say. Saturated fat is bad. Monounsaturated fat is better. Good. We get a smiley face for that one. Polyunsaturated is good. Smiley face. Trans fats are a unique fat, and maybe we can lecture on that again sometime, but here's what happened. The uh, <clears throat> public heard that saturated fat is bad and unsaturated fat is good, so they said to industry, give us unsaturated. And industry knew that uh, unsaturated doesn't act the same. You can't make a pie crust if you use oil. It just isn't the same. <laughs> The uh, crust isn't quite as flaky or nice. You need a straight fat because that's the way it acts better. Now you want unsaturated and those are oils, so how's it going to work? So what they did was they figured out a way to take a bent fat and make it straight. And it could still be called unsaturated. And they did it by doing this. <laughs> it's still unsaturated, but it's straight. And so the trans fats, there's a lot of them in our uh, uh, dietary these days. Uh, trans fats and partially hydrogenated fats, the same thing. Think of them the same way as the same thing. And these are even worse than saturated fats for a variety of uh, reasons. So these uh, two uh, get a, um, a very unhappy uh, face next to them. So, when you're looking in the grocery store and shopping, please read those labels and make sure that uh, you avoid the trans and partially hydrogenated fats, minimize the saturated fats, 
and we'd rather take more of the mono and polyunsaturated. Recognizing now that all fats still have the same number of calories. When I was in medical school, the studies were just coming out about how good monounsaturates were for the heart. And the cardiology residents were running around the hospital with these little vials of, uh, or bottles of olive oil, and they would take a swig every now and then. <laughs> You can get fat on that stuff too, <laughs> okay? So just because it's a good fat doesn't mean that it doesn't have too many calories in it. Let's be wise about this. And it can stimulate cholesterol because your body needs detergent in order to move oil around the body. Now, <clears throat> let's move on to another set of terms which you may be uh, uh, or, may or may or may not be acquainted with, probably are. Uh, fat comes into our body in a unique sort of a way. It comes down into our stomachs. It's, it's mixed up. And then the long fats are not treated like other food. They actually go into the lymphatic system. Instead of going into the bloodstream, they go into the lymphatics. It goes up behind the, in the, behind the heart, in the back of the chest, and dumps into the uh, blood supply just before the inferior vena cava dumps the blood into the heart. That way the fat is mixed with the most blood possible. These fat globules that carry the, uh, uh, the fat, because it doesn't mix uniformly, the, <laughs> the detergent, the cholesterol, uh, helps to bundle these things in packages. Now, <clears throat> if this were the size of the package of fat, now that big yellow circle in the bottom right hand corner, this is the size of a red blood cell, or about the size. What would happen if all those big fat globules were released into the bloodstream and went to the liver? They could actually kill you. And so God has designed the system that the fat should actually go up and dump into the blood where it can be mixed with the largest amount of blood and, and dealt with safely. That fat globule will go along through the bloodstream until it runs, gets stuck in a blood vessel that is too small. You see the little red blood cell? The red blood cell has to fold in two in order to get through a small capillary. What do you think those big fat globules do? They really plug things up. And they go along, they float along until they get stuck and then the fat is released into the surrounding tissues. That makes it smaller, so it scooches on a little further and releases some more. That's a little discouraging, isn't it? The fat that we eat is much more likely to be stored someplace we don't want it than it would be, for example, carbohydrates, uh, sugars, starches, and those types of things. So fat moves around in bumble, uh, bundles. The first bundle is called the chylomicron. You, uh, that's generally not measured in your blood test. And of course, I've given you a picture of a red blood cell here. The, the cholesterol fat bundle that you've probably heard of most is called the low density lipoprotein, LDL. Now, <clears throat> When scientists wanted to understand uh, what was happening with the fats in the blood, they took a vial of blood and they spin it and that the red blood cells go to the bottom and then there, especially in, in people with more fat in their blood, there's a layer of fat that's kind of yellow and then there's the clear stuff on top of that. So then they would take the fatty layer and put it in a centrifuge. Now a centrifuge spins it, spins it very fast over a period of time, and you would expect that as that centrifuge is spinning, those things that were heaviest would go furthest, and those things that were lightest would not go as far, because heavier would have more force pulling it out. That's, that's the way they named these things. So the low density, or the light ones, were called the LDLs. That was our basic understanding. We now know that there are many different kinds that they've gone to look at it, but this is what it's called, low-density lipoprotein. It, these low-density lipoproteins start out as something that's called a very low-density lipoprotein. They're full of fat, and they take the fat that the liver makes and distributes it to the body, just like the chylomicrons do. 
But this time, instead of coming from food, it came from the liver. Now, cholesterol, most cholesterol in the body is also made in the liver. And you know, the cells of the body need cholesterol. Cholesterol is a detergent. It's necessary. We think of it as bad, but we need some. The liver makes it, and it is sent out in these VLDLs, very low-density lipoproteins. The fat is taken away, and now they're called LDLs, and they're very high in cholesterol. They distribute cholesterol and fat to the body. These are the ones that are most likely to cause us the most damage, to hurt our body, to increase our risk of heart attack the greatest. Our goal would be to get those less than 100 milligrams per deciliter, and for people with diabetes, the doctors are now saying get it less than 70. So it's being pushed way down. Now, LDL is a little bit of a hard thing, name to remember, so I would suggest that you consider little devils. LD, right? Little devil lipoproteins. These are the bad ones. You'd like to get them absolutely as low as you can. Make sense? Okay, what can we do to lower our little devils? Well, to lower your little devils, you avoid saturated fat, trans fat, partially hydrogenated, and decrease your overall fat intake. So that's pretty straightforward. We already know that those things are, the, the straight fats stimulate more cholesterol production. So if you want to decrease the cholesterol in your blood, you decrease the saturated or straight fats. Whether they come from saturated or the trans or the partially hydrogenated, you would need to decrease them. Number two, you can change from, uh, change to mono and polyunsaturates. So that's another thing that can be beneficial that tends to decrease the LDLs, those little devils. Another thing to do is to decrease your insulin needs. It so happens that insulin seems to stimulate more of this LDL. Uh, when you eat a meal that is high in sugar and the sugar goes in fast, for example, uh, I, I hate to even say it, <clears throat> uh, Big Mac, <clears throat> fries, and a milkshake, okay? Now, that's a, that's a lot of saturated fat, <clears throat> but it's also a lot of sugar. So the sugar goes up, the insulin goes up to take the sugar down, and that insulin stimulates more cholesterol and tends to put the fat into storage. And in, as part of that mechanism, it really increases the little devils. So when you choose food that is lower in sugar, or, or better yet, high in fiber, because the fiber hangs onto the sugars and lets, them, lets it go into the body more slowly, then you, you have less insulin, you have less of that stimulus to make those little devils. Yes, ma'am. She said, do you, if you eat bread and rice almost every day, does it increase your insulin need? It depends really on what you're taking. If you're talking about brown rice and rye bread or whole wheat bread, you'll get much less a rise out of your blood sugar than if you use white bread. The pastries, the cakes, and those types of things with refined flours, raise the blood sugar and the insulin levels just about as much as plain sugar. People get confused. They think if it's not sweet, it's not going to raise my sugar. Unfortunately, <laughs> white flour tends to act about like sugar in the body, even though it's not sweet. So we get fooled by that. We think we're eating something that's healthy. Rice is not nearly as bad as wheat, so even white rice is, is, uh, is going to be about the same as as uh, white rice can be about the same as whole wheat bread. The best bread that I've seen, as far as the studies, is uh, rye bread. So that's very good, especially that 100% rye if you can get a hold of it. Good question. Thank you. And here, I think I've mentioned this already, high fiber, that is, when you eat a lot of plants, plants come high in fiber, and ge in, in general, we can say they're low in fat. Now, my wife and I had an avocado today for lunch. 
or part of one. And, and some things like avocados and nuts and are a little higher in fat, but it comes with the plant's own cholesterol-like molecules, and they don't seem to stimulate our own cholesterol production nearly as bad if we eat it as a whole food. It's when we take it out, when we take the sugars and fats out of the plants and take the corn oil and make salad dressing, or when we refine it, the more we refine it, the more problems we tend to call, cause our body. Okay, <clears throat> there is a cholesterol distribution system. There is also a cholesterol garbage collection system. And you might guess now that the high-density lipoproteins were the heavy ones that went the furthest. And we recognize that they are going out to recycle the cholesterol and bring it back to the liver we would like this as high as possible. Uh, for males, I think it's, as, it's above 40. And for females, it's uh, greater than 50. And to make this easier to remember, we're going to rename them. Instead of high density, these are heavenly darlings. They're good. <laughs> and the higher they are, the better off you're going to be. So that's those two packages. Did I raise any questions in your mind? This that one's called um, your good cholesterol. Okay, we sometimes refer to this as good cholesterol. Good point. Yes, sir. What's the difference between the males and females? Uh, that will be, uh, become obvious in our next uh, kind of piece of this slide, and that is what can we do to make our heavenly darlings go up, right? Well, the first thing we can do is to exercise. Exercise raises the heavenly darlings, which is great. And the second one is estrogen. Since estrogen tends to raise the heavenly darlings in ladies, and the raise in the heavenly darlings that comes from estrogen does not protect against heart attack. So the ladies get a higher level. They have to reach a higher standard, if we can put it that way. So uh, that's the reason why the men and women's levels are just a little bit different. She says, where does estrogen come from? Estrogen comes from the ovaries. It's the hormone that uh, makes a woman a woman. Uh, so <clears throat> it's very special stuff. None of us want to get rid of it, right? We, we all uh, want, although some of us would rather be married to it than actually have it ourselves. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> If you, she says, if you have a complete hysterectomy with ovaries removed, then what happens? Well, then it's pretty much gone. And if you've been through the menopause and had the hot flashes and all those things, you know something about estrogen going away. I, I will tell you that uh, other tissues in the body can make estrogen, and it can be made from adrenal androgens. That is, the adrenal gland puts hormones out that the body can change. Uh, the fat cells can do that. Most of the cells in the body can make that change. So there will be a little bit of estrogen in most uh, any woman from adrenal androgens, although that doesn't help the menopausal symptoms all that much in some. What else can we do to raise the heavenly darlings? We can stop smoking. Smoking depresses heavenly darlings. We can have a thankful attitude. Now, I like to say it this way. It's kind of a positive way. Sometimes people say, if you want to raise your HDL, uh, decrease your stress. But you and I know that people respond to stress differently. You can ask somebody to get up in church and do something in a month, and you know, they won't be able to sleep any until that, <laughs> that finally happens. And another person will go to the same experience, say, no problem, and they get right up on the platform and do it. It's really how we relate to it more than the stress itself, right? And so I like to say <clears throat> a positive, thankful attitude is how we relate to it that makes the biggest difference. And then <clears throat> decrease those saturated trans and partially hydrogenated fats because those tend to make this Heavenly darlings go down and replace that with monounsaturates, which tends to help. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry about the cough. 
Well, <clears throat> how do we know whether we're going to have a heart attack? If you just look at your cholesterol, you might be confused. What's a normal cholesterol? Does anybody know? The laboratory says your cholesterol should be less than 200. Did you know that one-third of the heart attacks in this country this year will be in people whose cholesterol is less than 200? That's pretty scary, isn't it? And you know there are people who have high cholesterols who will never have a heart attack. And cholesterol, as we learned about it from the Framingham study, is a helpful tool when we think about populations, but it's much harder to uh, make it useful for individuals. I can't tell by just looking at your cholesterol whether you're at risk for a heart attack or not. Because cholesterol is not the disease, it's just a marker for the disease. Does that make sense? So we look for better markers. The LDL is a better marker, that is those little devils, are a better marker than the cholesterol, but it's still not perfect. Here's a better one still. It's called the total cholesterol to heavenly darling ratio. Total cholesterol to HDL ratio. And this is how those numbers work. If your ratio is less than four, you're not making any more atherosclerosis. If your ratio is less, is, uh, less than three, that is, yeah, if it gets down less than three, you're actually reversing your atherosclerosis. So between three and four, you're not getting worse. Over four, you're getting worse. Less than three, you're getting better. These are numbers that I learned from uh, William Costelli, who ran the Framingham uh, study for years. Uh, so these are better numbers if you want to have a look at them. But remember, numbers do not give us the full answer. Now, <clears throat> some of you may know my wife, Dina. She is a health educator, a nurse practitioner, and she loves to teach people how to eat right, how to exercise, and to take care of their lives. Have you all heard of the Coronary Health Improvement Project, the CHIP program? Yeah, she's been teaching that for a good number of years. She went out <clears throat> here, uh, you know, she came home one day with her cholesterol level in hand, and she was weeping. She said, look, my cholesterol. It's 280. I'm going to have to quit. I can't teach this class to people. Look at my cholesterol. <laughs> now, <clears throat> her family tends to come thin. Her father was that, not her mother, but she inherited this from her father, this thinness. I've always had to struggle with my weight, and <clears throat> she would gain a few pounds, and she would go, and the weight would be gone. I, I don't know how she did it, okay? <laughs> but her cholesterol was high. And I said, okay, uh, your cholesterol was high, but I'd certainly like to know something else. Besides that, I would like to know about your heavenly darlings, right? So I grabbed her sheet, and I looked at her heavenly darlings, and her heavenly darlings were 103. So if you take 260 and divide it by 103, what do you get? about 2.6. 2.6 is in the range of reversal. You see how the numbers can kind of fool you? <clears throat> Yet, these are still markers. They're not necessarily the disease. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. If, the, if you go to the doctor and the doctor says your cholesterol is 210 but everything looks good and then... So you have chosen a lifestyle which is healthy and... So it's all being done and the numbers just aren't quite right. You know, that's actually a very common problem. And I've been trying to point out to you that those are, are numbers that uh, are good for populations, but they're hard to know for sure on individuals. I look at the numbers as motivators. I know that if my cholesterol is high, my risk goes up. Now, I can, um, I can 
ignore it and keep right on eating junk food, right? Living a sedentary lifestyle, or I can make changes to improve that. If my number is high, I know my risk is up and I need to make those changes. As a doctor, I use the numbers to help motivate me. For example, if somebody's cholesterol's high and their little devils are too high and <laughs> they've had a heart attack and they've got diabetes, well, I may say to them, you need to be on a medicine to lower your cholesterol, right? But if you're living well and your cholesterol numbers are not quite what the lab says is perfect, that doesn't mean that you're sitting on the edge of a heart attack. They're motivators. If your numbers are out of place, that's a reminder that you need to make wise choices. Because the numbers are not disease, they're just markers. What we really want to know is disease. Does that make sense to, to folks? Because I have a lot of people that are upset about that and, and confused. Uh, if you're making good lifestyle choices, you can actually be reversing the disease even though your, quote, numbers aren't perfect. Yes, ma'am. I mean, doesn't it have to do with your HDL and LDL ratio as well as the numbers? Is it one that's there is an LDL to HDL cholesterol ratio as well, uh, and I'm not sure whether that's what you're asking about. It's a little better than this one, but this is the one that I know the predictive numbers on, and it's pre they're pretty close. So uh, I, I use this one myself. Yes, ma'am. Do your triglycerides figure into all of this too? Their tri triglycerides figure in as well. And if your insulin starts to go up in your body, it tends to drive your triglycerides up. Uh, if you eat or drink alcohol, for example, alcohol gets turned into triglycerides. Uh, so as triglycerides go up, it's fat, you're measuring the triglycerides or the fat in the blood. If fat is being moved around in the blood, you would expect that cholesterol might go up a little bit, especially if it's low. What I generally see is when people start out with very high cholesterols and they go through a lifestyle change, where they start to exercise, they move to a plant-based diet, uh, I see their numbers like triglycerides and the total cholesterol, the LDL, they'll come down a long way. And the HDL will do pretty good. It'll go up a little bit. It doesn't move as quickly as some of the others, but, or as far. But those are positive changes. If somebody starts out with a very low cholesterol and they begin to lose weight, their fat is coming out of their storage, going into the bloodstream, and sometimes the cholesterol will go up a little bit. It's not going to go up real high, but those types of things happen because this is a normal physiologic response. The body is moving more fat and burning it for weight loss, and so the body needs a little more detergent for now. Things will level out after a while. You don't have to worry about that. We need to understand these uh, numbers in context. Good questions. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Is there a danger from taking too much cholesterol medications? Cholesterol medications do a couple of things. They block the body's formation of cholesterol and they decrease inflammation by a mechanism that we don't understand. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. It is true that as we get older and generally 75, 80 and above is where I'm more likely to see it, there can be problems that develop from cholesterol being too low. Relatively uncommon is a loss of memory, but boy, if the memory decreases, it's something that's worth considering. Uh, and sometimes there's muscle aches and pains, probably because of that decrease in uh, cholesterol, not quite enough of it. Okay, that's a good question too. So the, the cholesterol-lowering medications can be very helpful, but do we, if we, do we really want to take them if we don't need them? So we have to weigh the evidence and we have to do the right thing. Okay? Yes, ma'am. The cholesterol medication, there's a whole bunch of standards for that. And generally, it's, well, it's a little hard to go over those things in detail now. We have, you know, tables that say, you know, if you're at this age and then this, and if you're at that age, then this, and we use little different levels depending on how, what your heart attack risk is. So they do a risk assessment and when your risk of heart attack in the next 10 years starts to go up, then they'll say, 
You better get started on it. So we're looking at a lot of different things. And if, you, if, you're, if you're making good lifestyle choices, your risk should stay low. So it shouldn't be a problem. Yes, ma'am. Does atherosclerosis make angina? <clears throat> that is a good question. I would like to talk a little bit more about that as we move on. Because this has been quite a little bit of a journey. Let's talk about it. If you want to know about the disease in your arteries, how do you go about looking at the disease in your arteries? <clears throat> the cholesterol is simply a blood number. It doesn't tell you about the blockage. How have we looked at the blockage? We've used, have you ever heard of it, an angiogram, right? Where they put this catheter up in your groin, it goes up around the heart, little pigtail falls into the coronary artery, they inject some dye and take pictures of it. You see the dye going down through, and then there is a blockage, right? So now we know we have a blockage. What I would like to know without... My cholesterol tends to run a little bit high. I don't have any angina at all. I have a little angina, and uh, I, don't, I don't know. I didn't know it could be reversed. It, it is, it can be reversed, and we've known that for some time. And you're right, it's the angina that is caused by that blockage. When the artery has the blockage in it, like we see on the angiogram, the blood doesn't flow easily. And when your heart is stressed, so not enough blood is getting past the blockage, the heart muscle will complain a little bit, and we will call that angina. It's that heavy feeling in your chest that uh, there's, it's, it's like a charley horse in the heart muscle. <laughs> so that's, that's its sense. You all, if you ever had a charley horse, you know how it hurts? Same sort of a thing. The, uh, the blood is not getting there. The heart muscle is going into spasm. And it can hurt, that pressure sensation in the chest. So that's where it comes from. What I would like to know is uh, what the inside of my arteries look like. That's more important than simply the cholesterol numbers, right? And because my cholesterol numbers tend to run a little bit high, I know stress has something to do with it. I, I remember moving to a new job. I had my cholesterol checked in between, and it was perfect. And then, I, uh, be, as part of my job, one of the benefits was a little life insurance policy. So they came by while I was at work, working in the prompt urgent care, you know, taking care of people. They said, we're going to draw your blood. They want to know what your cholesterol is. So they took my cholesterol and... Whoo! It was up almost 100 points, right? So I know that the stress has something to do with it. Now, I have decided that I don't, my risk is low. I have a very good lifestyle. I exercise regularly. Pretty much 100% plant-based diet. Uh, weight is, is good. So I don't think I'm at high risk. Yet I'm still concerned because my cholesterol is high. So I went to a friend of mine who has a machine that allows us to check the, the carotid intimal thickness. You know, if this atherosclerosis is having in the, happening in the body, it doesn't happen in just one artery. It happens in a bunch of arteries. And the ones in the carotid, that is right up here in the neck, the carotid arteries take the blood from the heart to the head. And if they're blocked up, then that would be a good sign that there's a blockage in my heart too. And so I had an ultrasound done checking intimal thickness in my carotid artery. And they told me it looked really good. So I said, fine with the numbers. I've used them for motivating for a good lifestyle change. Now I'm going to stop worrying because my arteries are clean. You see, this is an artery wall over here. We have uh, outer wall, the muscle cells, and then the inner lining cells. And it would be in this area, kind of between the inner lining and the muscle, that you would get that atherosclerosis. I'll show you a picture of that here in a little bit. But that's kind of a piece, if we can look at it that, that way, a, a diagram or a, a picture of a piece of the artery uh, wall. And there's one in my neck, which can be measured. So if your numbers are high and you've made good lifestyle choices and you'd like to find out a good way to do that is to check uh, uh, carotid artery uh, intimal thickness. Now, 
This has been a very interesting journey for us to try to understand heart disease. The, the next thing on my list is something called IVUS. And this is kind of the latest technology. They're not doing this on everybody. They're doing it on, uh, it's almost, it's kind of a research tool now. It's done like an angiogram. That is, they put the catheter in the groin, it goes up into the heart, it goes down into the uh, coronary artery, and they stick it all the way in as far as it will go. Then they turn on the ultrasound transducer. Now, ultrasound is fascinating technology. I like ultrasound tests because they don't hurt, right? <laughs> I tell people it's just a fancy fish finder. <laughs> It sends out a sound, and it listens for the sound coming back, and the computer takes that sound bounce back and turns it into a picture. Well, on the tip of the catheter is an ultrasound transducer. It sends the sound and listens that is spinning 360 really fast, sending out the sound and listening all at the same time. They turn that on and pull it out. As they pull it out, they get a picture of the inside lining of the artery. So we can see not just what the hole is, but we can see what's underneath the hole. That is, you can see the atherosclerosis. Fascinating technology which has opened up to us a whole new world of understanding. This path to understanding the truth about heart disease has been one full of pitfalls and confusion. Let's see if we can clear it up and help you understand a little better. Remember we talked about the problem with cholesterol? Framingham study discovered cholesterol increased risk of heart attack. How do we get our cholesterol down? Well, it seemed obvious to us. You stop eating cholesterol, but when they checked it in the laboratory, it didn't work that well. Oh, yeah, we're animals. We make cholesterol. So the obvious wasn't quite true. And so, we moved on to the next step, and we said, we found the blockages. The blockages are causing the heart attacks. So, what we need to do is to get around the blockage. Have you ever heard of a bypass? They do an angiogram, discover the blockage, and then run a conduit, an extra blood vessel, if you will, from another artery to come in past to try to take care of that blockage. Now, uh, the picture here on the screen, you can see, comes from uh, Adam, which is a, kind of an anatomical uh, software. You can see the muscle fibers. You can see the atherosclerosis in here. And then the lining, inner lining, looks like it's getting ready to break here in the red blood cells over here. And then this is kind of the outside of the blood vessel. So that gives you a, a little picture of what that atherosclerosis looks like, although the truth is that would be a very early little plaque. So we said there's a blockage, let's do a bypass. But, man, that's a lot of work. You've got to split somebody's chest open, uh, open heart surgery. I mean, that's big stuff. Is there an easier way? Yes. Oh, we've, uh, we've now figured out that we can uh, do it with... Um, have you heard of this uh, angioplasty? Put a balloon into the blockage, open the balloon up, and it pushes the blockage away. Well, as we did that, we discovered that you push the blockage out of the way, and the blockage will come back in a few months. If you don't do anything else, the blockage will come back. So I wonder if it would stay open longer if we used a stent. So they get a piece of wire or some other material. They put it inside over top of the balloon, they push the balloon out, and then they leave this thing in place, hoping that it will keep it open. It's been a little disappointing because those plug up too. And so now they come up with another idea. They said, let's put something on the stint to keep it from uh, uh, <laughs> growing back. 
So they put some, it's actually like a cancer treatment drug on there to keep it from growing back. The only problem is it has kept the body from endothelializing it, that is, from putting it back to smooth and safe. Now, <laughs> it's more likely to cause a heart attack or a blood clot. So they have to leave people on blood thinners longer and longer because of the intervention. So, <clears throat> while they're doing all these procedures, the bypasses, the <laughs> angioplasty, the stints, some very interesting things happen. Occasionally, while somebody is lying on the table in the angiogram suite, they have a heart attack. Now, there's a no better place to have a heart attack than right there. They've got everything you need to take care of it, now including the clot busters. So they can hit it right now and take care of it. As they began to look at these heart attacks that happened while they were on the table, they discovered something that was very surprising. And I would suspect would be surprising to you, too. Heart attacks were not happening where the blockage was. It was downstream. Isn't that weird? Now, here we are confused again. We thought the blockage was the problem. It's not the blockage that's the problem. The blockage causes the angina. But the heart attacks are caused when the blood vessel opens up, cracks. When the, when the atherosclerosis, the hardening of the arteries, cracks open. And it's not as, li well, let's put it this way, it's more likely to happen somewhere else. It's not that it never happens where the blockage is. It's just more likely to happen somewhere else. Surprise. So what makes the blood vessel more likely to break open? Isn't that the question that you want to know? It's the, it's the one that I would like to know. <clears throat> the sturdy plaques, the ones that have a tough, and we call it a fibrous cap, are the ones that are less likely to break. And the ones that cause angina tend to be that kind. It's the ones that have a thin cap. You see, what happens is, the crack is beginning to happen here. You can see it on this one. If that cracks, the stuff inside will come out here and there will be a blood clot almost immediately because that stuff stimulates the blood to just clot. So where is that weakness? When the top of the, that covering is weak, that's when it's more likely to break. And the thing that seems to make the biggest difference on that is something called inflammation. What an interesting journey. We thought it was cholesterol. We thought it was the blockage. And now we're understanding that even more important than the cholesterol and the blockage is the inflammation. Now, you all have heard of inflammation, haven't you? Inflammation can be caused by infection. You probably know that. If you've ever had a boil or an abscess on your skin, you know that there's that pus pocket and then there's the redness around it. We would call it inflammation. And the infection can cause that. An infection in our body anywhere can increase the inflammation in the blood vessels and make these things more likely to crack open and for people to have a heart attack. We've been able to prove that. If you have dental disease, the gingiva, the gingivitis, isn't that what they call it? If you have that, you're not taking care of your teeth, it increases your risk of a heart attack. There were a group of men in uh, France that were studied. Uh, somebody had noticed that in these, in, in autopsies, people who had heart attacks, they actually found bacteria in there, bacteria called chlamydia. Have you ever heard of chlamydia? Sometimes it's a venereal disease, doesn't have to be. They took a group of men who were at risk of heart attack, they treated half of them for chlamydia, and the other half they said, well, we'll see what happens. There was a 50% reduction in heart attack rate in the people who got the treatment. So just the infection in the body can make the difference. Isn't that interesting? Whether you have a chronic sinus infection, or anything that's, that will increase inflammation can increase your risk of a heart attack. Fascinating. Are there other things that can cause inflammation? Yes, there are. Have you ever heard of homocysteine? Sometimes the doctors are checking homocysteine. Homocysteine is amino acid. It's a protein. And when it's in your bloodstream at high levels, it 
irritates the lining of the blood vessels and makes heart attacks more likely to happen. We have a test that we use to look at inflammation in the blood vessels. Maybe you've heard of it. It's called a cardio CRP and it looks at inflammation in the blood vessels. So we're using that to look for inflammation now. Although it's not done as a full screening tool because we don't we don't understand everything about it yet, and it's not a perfect tool. Yes, ma'am. If you have mitral valve prolapse, mitral valve prolapse is a whole different disease, and it does not affect the risk of atherosclerosis. It has to do with a little string on one of the valves is broken. So it's not a big deal, unless it's causing some irregular heartbeats, but it's not atherosclerosis. It's a whole different kind of heart disease, more structural and electrical than blood vessel. Yes? Um, lately, there have been that kind of test with a group of people that come and they do different tests with the clotting and uh, to check to see if you have any clot. Is that? She says there are some people uh, doing screening tests. They'll do an ultrasound of your carotid artery. That's helpful. They'll also do it because it's indicated for men over age 65 to have an ultrasound of the aorta because sometimes there's an aneurysm that develops. An aneurysm is another kind of, it's related to this disease. So yes, uh, those screenings can be helpful in identifying what the arteries really look like. Good. Yes, ma'am. What about a nuclear stress test? Let's talk about a stress test, okay? What happens with a stress test is the doctor puts the wires, or the nurse, somebody puts the wires on you to listen to surround sound for your heart, right? So it's listening from the arm, it's listening from the uh, legs, it's listening from shoulder, it's, just, it's listening to the heart from a lot of different directions. Then you're put on a treadmill and asked to exercise. While you're exercising, it generally starts out low and slow, and then every three minutes it gets steeper and faster. The machine always wins, right? <laughs> it always wins. <laughs> but when you start to huff and puff, then your heart is being strained, and we're looking at the electrical... <laughs> We're looking for electrical changes in your heart that indicate the heart muscle is not getting enough oxygen. So that's what a stress test is for. Now, a stress test with a, the EKG is not 100% accurate. That is, you can have a little bit of low oxygen to some of the heart muscle and not pick it up on the, with your eyes on the electricity. So what they do is they add something else. They add a... Uh, something they can take a picture of, they call it nuclear medicine. They inject it into the blood and it will stick, it will go into any heart muscle cells that have been low in oxygen. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't really understand. So then you stop your stress test, they put that in, that stuff in then, and then you wait a while and then they'll send you down to lie under the camera and say, did any of the heart muscle have a hard time getting oxygen? Because that stuff will have gone in there. Another thing they'll do is an echo stress test. On the stress test, immediately lay down and then use an ultrasound to look at your heart. And the wall of the heart that is not getting enough oxygen will be a little bit floppy. It's not going to be uh, contracting like it's supposed to. So that adds another level of accuracy to are you, is your heart muscle getting the question, answering the question, is your heart muscle getting enough oxygen? So that's what those stress tests are about. Yes? Uh, what was the, would you repeat again what the name was of that test uh, for inflammation? Inflammation. CRP. It's called C, it's C reactive protein, is what it stands for. There's one for inflammation in general, but the one that's really accurate for heart is called cardio CRP. And that's a very interesting test to have done if you really want to know about your risk now. Technically, you're supposed to do it two of them one week apart and average the two of them. If it's less than one, excellent. If it's between one and three, average. If it's greater than three, trouble. Okay? <laughs> if it's greater than ten, there's an infection somewhere. So that's generally the way we look at that. Less than one, great. Between one and three, average. 
An average American, in my opinion, is not good enough when it comes to heart disease. We just have too much of it here. Yes? Is atrial fibrillation related to this? Atrial fibrillation may be related to this, but it's more related, it's more an electrical problem. And what happens with atrial fibrillation is the heart has two sides and it has a top and a bottom. The blood comes into the top on the right hand side and the uh, electricity makes that top contract. That pushes the blood into the bottom half of the heart which really pushes it hard. And then it goes into the right, into the lungs, back to the left and then out to the body. Top half electrically and then the bottom half electrically. One, two, one, two, like that. <clears throat> what happens with atrial fibrillation is that atrium will get a little too large or a little too irritated, and the two together are really you know, bad news. And the electricity, instead of going jump and then down, starts running around in circles. So the top half of the heart is not pumping just before the bottom half of the heart. It's just going all the time, and it's not coordinated. So it's just it's here and there. So it's not coordinated. That increases the risk of blood clot, but that's inside the heart, not in the blood vessels of the heart. And those blood clots can break out and go to the lungs to call, cause a pulmonary embolism, or can go to the brain and cause a stroke, right? So we are really careful about those, and we use blood thinners to help decrease the risk when someone has atrial fibrillation. But it's a different disease. Yes, ma'am. This is just a simple question. If, it, if you're going up a slight grade and you get short of breath, do you continue going or do you go around the She's, uh, This is the lady who has uh, already told us, that I think, <coughs> that she has a problem with angina. And, and she starts to exercise, going up a little bit of a hill, and she starts to get a little bit of chest pressure. Now. That worries me a little bit, and if that were me, I think I would want to have uh, maybe that blockage taken care of, and an angioplasty might be helpful as a step. But um, the truth is, that's only a temporary step. If you really want to deal with this, there has to be diet change, there has to be regular exercise. Having said that, if you're making those lifestyle changes, and it's amazing, within five to seven days, often, with uh, the appropriate lifestyle changes, those arteries open up and that angina can go away even without having a procedure. Here's what happens. You start up the incline, it puts a little more stress on the heart muscle. The blood pressure is trying to go up a little bit. The heart, the muscles are trying to, they're needing a little more oxygen. The heart muscle begins to complain a little bit. <clears throat> if one gently walks through it, the muscles, blood vessels, sometimes will open up and the blood pressure will drop down and when that happens, the angina will go away. I've seen that happen many times before. It's a little scary. I wouldn't want to push really hard through it. Generally, what we do is give you a bottle of nitroglycerin and say, you're getting that pressure? Take this. Yeah. Okay. So you know all about that. I thought maybe you did. Yes. Her sister is only 93, she says. Well, that's great. I can tell you, uh, there's a little interest here. My wife's grandmother was 85 when Grandpa died. What was that? 80. Okay. That was the voice of, the, of uh, her, her granddaughter. Was 80 when Grandpa died. She had angina. She was a fluffy... Grandma, okay, who had a touch of diabetes and some high blood pressure. And her daughter said, you're coming to live with me. At 80 years of age with angina, <coughs> uh, my mother-in-law, my wife's mother, put her mother on a plant-based diet, got her exercising, and she describes <coughs> Grandma going down the front steps, Walking to the, making the turn, stopping, holding her heart, getting her nitro out, putting it under her tongue, <laughs> and uh, then breathing a little easier and walking on. And that's pretty scary. Am I killing my mom, you know? <laughs> well, Grandma began to lose weight. Her chest pain went away. 
And I can tell you that she became a very vigorous woman. She died at 103 of something completely different. Okay? It's never too late to make a change. It just makes sense. <clears throat> now, I'm gonna, I, we've got about 10 minutes left here. Uh, I, I don't want to wear out my welcome, but let's talk about something. There are some people who are out there telling you that they can help your heart disease with chelation. Have you ever heard that? And uh, the whole idea is there's calcium deposits. You can even get a scan, a CT, a fast spiral CT of your heart, and it will show you if you have calcium deposits in the arteries of your heart. Sometimes this, uh, the fat deposits will actually get calcium in them. And they tell us that if you get this chelation therapy, and the only way to get it is IV. So you have to go into the office, it's very expensive, and you have the chelation put into your arteries. And that's supposed to help reverse your atherosclerosis. Does that make sense with what you've learned? No. Is the problem calcium? The problem is not calcium. The primary problem, well, I suppose, if we want to go through it, it's cholesterol. Damaged, if you know all about this, damaged LDL particles, the bad ones, which are taken into the wall of the blood vessels, grabbed by the cells of the body that are supposed to fight it, and turn them into foam cells, and that turns into this atherosclerosis. Now, some of it will turn into cholesterol, but <clears throat> or some of it will, turn, will become calcified, cholesterol and calcium, they start with C. Some of it will turn into calcium, but it's not even in the blood. It's in the walls, right? And the problem is more inflammation. Now, your body needs to keep the calcium level in your blood perfect. If it gets out of whack, you'll start to have tingling around your lips. You can have muscle spasm and heart irregularities. Your body has a couple systems that work very carefully to keep the calcium balanced. You cannot tell about your calcium in your bones, for example, by ta taking a blood test of the calcium. It does doesn't work because the calcium is kept perfect, because the body has to have it that way for electricity and a bunch of reasons. So if I run something into your veins to bind the calcium, like they say is happening, chelating the calcium out, where is the calcium going to come from? It's going to come out of the blood, and the body's balance will pull the calcium out of the bone and put it back in the blood to keep it right there. It's not going to go into the artery walls and pull it out. It makes no sense, and indeed the science, uh, those who have done real science on it, you don't find it benefiting. Would you, so, would you think that taking a supplement of like calcium, magnesium, and zinc would be a smart thing to do? She's asking about a supplement of calcium, magnesium, and zinc, and I think whenever you take calcium, you should have magnesium and zinc. These are very helpful, obviously, for bones, and it's an important part of the calcium balance system. But oh, and the magnesium, and it's way too complicated to talk about now, but the magnesium also helps to prevent heart disease. When you're low in magnesium, it's very common in this country because we don't eat enough plants. Magnesium in our diet comes from plants. When magnesium is low, this atherosclerosis is accelerated. So you, you're right about encouraging us to get magnesium. Let's talk a little bit about diet. If you want to reverse this atherosclerosis, you need to go on a diet that's low in saturated fat, preferably low in calories. You want the sugar to go into your body slowly, not like a storm, not like a tsunami, but very slowly so the insulin stays low and it doesn't have that stimulus. Oh, by the way, insulin tends to make the body more inflamed too. So the higher your insulin, the more inflammation. The more meat, the more inflammation. Meat also increases the inflammation in the body. We want to reverse that. We need to minimize animal products because the proteins, the animal proteins, tend to make more inflammation in the blood vessels. So our diet needs to be high in plants, low in animal products, and it's better if the sugar is going into the body slowly, which means we need unrefined foods. The closer you get it to the way God made it, the better off you are. So a diet change can make a big difference. Exercise can make a big difference. And of course, 
stopping smoking makes a lot of sense. The last thing on the list here is infection control. Make sure those teeth are taken care of and other things as well. Is there hope? Can this disease be turned around? I was hoping maybe Carl would be here tonight. Uh, Carl uh, is one of the fellows, and he would be, he's telling everybody, so it, it's no problem f for us to share his experience. Carl was very happy. Carl came to my first reversing diabetes class, and he was, oh, he was a bad one. His uh, blood pressure was really high, and his cholesterol was high, and his blood sugars were high. And he has switched much more closely to a plant-based diet. He's not all the way there, but he's moved a long way. And he's exercising, and his weight has come down, and his blood pressure has come down. The reason he came to my program the first time was because the doctor had said, you have a 90% blockage in your heart, and I want to put a stent in. And he said, no way. <laughs> I'm going to Dr. Guthrie's program. So he came to the program, and he kept on. He actually came to another program. So after two programs and 15 months later, he ends up in the emergency room, that crazy, you know, some of those crazy diseases that get us there. And they ended up taking him in to do another angiogram. And he was getting ready to argue with the doctor. The doctor was going to say, you've got to have to have another a stent. He was going to say, nope. I'm going to do it a different way. Doctor came out and said, well, blockage is only 50%. You don't need a stent. <laughs> <laughs> and boy, was Carl glowing all over. You could, I mean, his smile, he's, at least he's been telling everybody that, he, that, uh, that it's working. <laughs> it, the atherosclerosis is reversing from 90% down to 50%. That's good news, isn't it? You got a question. So, uh, generally, the principle I like to use is the closer we get to the way God made it, the better. When we take something raw, it has nutrients in it which could be destroyed by cooking. There is benefit to eating raw fruits, vegetables, whole grains. A little harder to do that with the whole grains, isn't it? <laughs> I've done it, okay, but it's a little harder. When we cook it, there may be some damage to some things, but there are also nutrients that are released by the cooking process. So it's really okay to have a balance of those. I would want to have some raw, and I would want to have some cooked. Uh, potatoes, for example, I'm not sure you'll get much benefit unless you cook them, right? <laughs> and uh, it's interesting, broccoli, if you eat some raw, it has some uh, enzymes in it that are really wonderful for cancer protection, which tend to uh, get destroyed if you do the cooking process. Uh, so it, it might be a good idea to have a little bit of both, right? You can actually, those enzymes can be released with a, with a sprig of the raw stuff. So uh, you can mix the two, and it, it won't hurt anything. As a general rule, the less processing, the better. Did I answer your question? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I just want to ask a question. We drink milk in our house, but we drink skim milk. Wouldn't it be better off for people? She says, we drink skim milk at our house, not whole milk, but skim milk. Well, <clears throat> skim milk is a whole lot better in a lot of ways than the whole milk, and certainly better than cream, because the fat has been removed. Uh, from my understanding of the scientific literature, and I've got the articles in my file, the proteins themselves in milk may cause some damage, especially if you take a lot of it. If you're eating a lot of plants and there's a little bit of milk protein, it's not such a problem. Uh, but if you're getting a lot of calories and a lot of calories from milk, if you're drinking a lot of it and not having very many plants, you're losing that protection. And that, would, that would really concern me. What about, what about soy milk? Is that a lot healthier? Soy milk is a good choice for myself because... I grew up with a weight problem, a little overweight. I have a hard time with the, with the full soy milk. It's got too much fat in it, so I dilute it. Okay. 
But it's good. They put the B12. They often put the calcium in it, those types of things. So soy milks are good. And the silk milk, I don't know if you've tried that, is wonderful. Uh, at our house, we use the silk with no sugar added, so, or the non-sweetened, which is really nice for people with diabetes. And it's quite tasty. I don't drink the stuff anymore. I just use it on cereal. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, she uh, says that uh, the neurologist told her husband that uh, vegetarians tend to get dementia because of the lack of B12. There are, um, it is true that people who are vegetarians are especially strict vegetarians, not lacto-ovo, but complete 100% vegan type, are more likely to have B12 deficiency. That is true, and that can lead to, well, to be fair, dementia is not, true dementia is not B12 deficiency. B12 deficiency, deficiency would be a cause of mental decline that hopefully one would fix, find, fix, and repair. When I find somebody, I'm looking at somebody with dementia, I will check for B12 deficiency because there's, that's something I can do something about. Dementia itself is, is uh, generally... Uh, a little more progressive and not tied to a single vitamin. It surprises a lot of people to know that there are many more people who are deficient in B12 who are meat eaters than vegetarians. So uh, what I tell people, to do, if you're choosing a plant-based diet, take a B12 supplement. It is really uh, the healthiest way to uh, uh, live, if you do it wisely. It can be unhealthy, but it's... Uh, yes? Oh, that's scary. I was up on my blood pressure monitor and not had it for four months. Uh, approximately two weeks ago, uh, a nurse in my doctor's office detected every fifth beat was missing. Uh, about a week ago, I ended up in the emergency room with my blood pressure becoming erratic and going up. He's described, I've got this microphone on, and, and uh, there are some people who are going to be trying to listen to this later. So let me kind of summarize uh, for folks. It all sounds pretty scary to me. Heart get, a few weeks ago, started to get irregular, and blood pressure went up. The nurse detected it. He went to the emergency room. Blood pressure over 200. That's pretty scary. Yeah. Sounds like my friend Carl. Uh, they, uh, the high blood pressure uh, can lead to the atrial fibrillation. It's actually one of the things that's pretty common. And yes, they can be related in a variety of different ways. So it's very hard for me to diagnose in a group like this. And, and generally, uh, we don't do full personal histories from the front. Okay. But yes, there may be a relation. She's asking about fish. How safe is fish? Uh, fish, as you know, has, uh, uh, there's been problems with mercury, and uh, uh, that's a concern. I prefer fish. The oils in fish are a lot better. The omega-3 fats tend to be calming. They're good for people with diabetes. The protein is about this. It's muscle protein, and it's the same whether it's a cow or a fish. So it doesn't make that much difference. The cholesterol is about the same. So there's not, the oils are really the, the uh, thing that are the biggest difference, and they tend to be common. Well, you know, we've used up a, an hour and a half, and you folks have just been wonderful, uh, uh, interactive, we've, you're a great audience, thank you very much. I'm going to be here for a while uh, afterwards, and I'm happy to answer other questions. I want to be uh, true to the time that we set, because... Uh, there are things, people need to take care of things this evening.